Want to boldly explore the universe? Try out Brilliant today. Brilliant's interactive examples and active problem solving help you develop your intuition in mathematics, science, and computer science that you may live long and prosper. Visit Brilliant.org slash ACL for 20% off the annual premium subscription. Welcome to A Captain's Log, the Star Trek talk show is set to bring you through a trek into Klingon and beyond with Star Trek's most iconic recurring role Klingon actor. Yes, I'm Lily Fox Lim with the ambassador to the fans, Brian Kreutz, and we're just ramping up towards a spectacular interview with J.G. Hertzler, who played the memorable Martok, making for the single most honorable Klingon apart from Worf, both who appeared in the most Star Trek ever as this species. Thank you, Lily. Exactly. It will be such an honor to bring in J.G. Hertzler via our view screen for an interview today. Now, I've had the pleasure to talk with J.G. over the phone, and he's not only a respected actor, but a very intelligent man who appeared two dozen times, not only as Martok, but other well-respected characters throughout the Star Trek series. J.G. Hertzler is also a well-known actor, appearing 38 times in Zorro the TV series from 1990 to 1993, and he's an author. I hope we get to hear him speak Klingon, especially with his famous gravelly, growly, baritone voice. Brian, you were telling me before the show that JG shares a German last name like yours and is one of the only people who you've ever met that pronounced your last name correctly right off the bat. You definitely Bashka. That's right, he is an honorable Klingon and the last name is is very honorable in german as well so yeah we do share that that same german american type tie last mm -hmm. name now proving that time flies when you're having fun we're already up to episode 11 here on a captain's Ooh. log now in basketball when you score 10 plus points you're said to be in double figures and that means that you're having a good game so we're glad to be up to double figures in episodes here. yes definitely and we hope to someday get up to triple figures <laughs> i hope so right <laughs> and with your help we can make it happen if you enjoy a captain's log please invite your trucky friends to watch and follow us on Instagram, a Captain's Log Show. Yeah, so what happened to the little man who brought drinking cocoa from a glass into fashion? <laughs> Our co co host, Raj. You know, interesting, Lily. We were just talking to him just a few moments ago. He mm. may be monitoring our communication and just went on to another com. Raj to Ambassador Kreutz. Oh, hey, Raj. <laughs> Raj, where have you been? We were just talking to you and the comm channel closed like you had somewhere urgent to go. Sorry, Bass and Lily, I'm back. I was monitoring your communications. I was returning from a visit to the International Astronomical Union. I was trying to get them to name a moon on Saturn after me. Well, we thought we were going to have to do the rest of the show without you. Does that mean I make you too happy? Like our theme song says? Oh, of course it does, Raj. You add so much to the show. You're a great Star Trek fan. You're so sweet and adorable. And how many other shows are lucky enough to have an alien as a co-co-host? Well, Federation Customs officially welcome Martok as we do here on a Captain's Log. I can't wait. He's probably waiting in an open channel to do the interview with mm -hmm. us now, Lily. <laughs> yes, we'll talk to you later, Raj. Okay. I'll, I'll be monitoring, monitoring your comms during this Klingon, Klingon interview and picking up pointers from J.G. on his Klingon speaking. This week we have the actor best known for playing Martok on Star Trek Deep Space Nine and who's also played seven other characters in various Star Trek productions. It's our honor and pleasure to have J.G. Hertzler as our special guest. Welcome to a Captain's Log. Question number one. Ready? <laughs> Ready? Ready? <laughs> 
JG, before you went into acting, you played football for Bucknell University. Tell us about your experience there as an athlete. I believe you played linebacker. Yeah, I, at, at linebackers aren't athletes. Uh, <laughs> line, line, linebackers are are Klingons with a face mask. Um, <laughs> linebackers, my I had no noticeable athletic skill. I I just like to run as hard as I could into other people and hit them with my forehead. That was my skill. And um, it explains many things about the rest of my life, I think. Um, but I did, I played for Bucknell and I, you know, I, I uh, was an outside linebacker on the left-hand side because I have a bad left, I literally have a bad left eye. And that's why uh, one of the reasons they covered it up they wanted to, uh, for the show, for DS9, they wanted to cover up my right eye when Martok came, emerged from the prison planet. And I said, you can't do that. It has to be my left eye. Um, or else I'll knock over things like Ferengis and things. Because uh, <laughs> I won't see them. And my football playing time was from 68 to 72. I was a political science major in college. Po two things have always been my passion. Uh, show business, after this period of time, uh, I played football, I think, because I was sort of expected. My uncle was a head football coach of a of another school. One quick note about that. The coach I had in high school was a guy named Coach Merricks, John Merricks. He's one of those people you meet in life that they're like two or three mentors of immense importance that you don't know it at the time. But as you look back, you say, holy cow. Um, we never lost a game in high school. Wow. Because of John Merrick. I dedicated my Star Trek book, the first one, to Coach John Merrick's, my football coach in, in high school. Several years later, I was flying to a convention, Star Trek convention. There were two or three large guys sitting in the row in front of me on the on the plane. To, I think we were going to Nashville. I, they were talking football. And they mentioned a couple names that I recognized about teams that I had played in high school. And I said, this is like in the late 2000s. And I said, are you guys football coaches from Prince George's County? They said, yeah. Yeah, what do you want? And, you know, like, <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? I said, I used to play in a high school in Prince George's County. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I was uh, at Crossland High School. They said, did you play for John Merricks? I said, yeah, he was my coach. They said, there it is. You played for John Merricks? It was like I said in in, in the in not in the natural in uh, Field of Dreams. You know, I mentioned uh, it was like I mentioned James Earl Jones's character too. Uh, you know, they said you you wrote with that you played for Merrick's. I said yeah. I said and they just asked me stories about him for the rest of the time. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps now telling the story. He meant a lot. So you mentioned that uh, running into people with your head was a Klingon experience during football. Does that help you with more physical roles like Martok when you're doing battles and uh, other physical acting? Yes. Any actor will tell you. It's like it, acting is like running into brick wall after brick wall after brick wall with your head. That's what <laughs> acting auditions are all about. Okay, let's see you hit that wall. Go! <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. There's a lot on the line in terms of your human dignity, in terms of your self-image, your self-confidence, your self-esteem. You put it out there on the line all the time, unless it doesn't mean anything to you. Like Rob, Robert Mitchum. Robert Mitchum said, you know, the great thing about acting is, is if you can fake honesty, you got it. Now, JG, you played in so many episodes, uh, half a dozen at least in Deep Space Nine as Martok. But... I want you to share the story, if you can, with the viewers. You were fighting um, in the Zorro series with actor Duncan Regar. Um, knowing he's the lead in the series, you didn't really want to harm him in any way, did you? <laughs> Tell us that story. I think I said that to be nice. I would really like to harm him and disfigure his face, but uh, he wouldn't <laughs> let me because uh, he was Zorro and I was not. Um, <laughs> I remember one time, uh, it, it, this show was shot in Madrid. Uh, a little tiny town called Comenar Viejo, just north of Madrid. Uh, so I, I was a pretty good sword fighter because uh, I had done a lot of sword fighting on stage. And if there's no cutting for it, there's no, you can't cut, hold it, restart. 
none of that live on stage. You got to get the fight right every time or else somebody gets badly wounded. So I had a lot of experience sword fighting. At one point, we were fighting across this rope bridge with wooden slats. Duncan Regeer, well, Duncan is about the handsomest man I'd ever seen. And um, then he puts a black mask on and that silk cape and the, the, the high leather boots and the silk hat, you know. He just looked like a billion dollars. <laughs> and then there was me. And I'm, I'm sword fighting him across. And I, in the middle of the fight, I stopped and I just said, look at you, Duncan. You're perfect. Just look at you. And uh, he, he was and he is. But uh, I had so much fun on that show. I was, I've been so lucky. And it was in space. Spain. <laughs> were you a Star Trek fan prior to working on Deep Space Nine? Or did you become a fan because you were on the show? I was a Twilight Zone fan. <laughs> where I saw for the first time uh, Captain Kirk, um, Bill Shat William Shatner, in that thing, in, in the most iconic star, I think one of the most iconic Twilight Zones ever was that you know they get the, look like a salt sucker on the wing, you know, out there. Yeah, I, I was. I I uh, I really I gotta say I really caught on to Star Trek because Star Trek was running from sixty six to sixty eight, right, or sixty seven. 66, seven, eight. And I was in graduating from high school, going into college where I really didn't do anything except uh, uh, play football and study as hard as I could. That's at least a half hour a day. And, um, and then go to beer, uh, <laughs> to the tavern. Um, so I missed a lot of Star Trek <laughs> at that point. But I saw most of it in reruns, as we all did, I think. Yes. Um, and McCoy, I think DeForest Kelly was, was my particular hero. JG, you played so many iconic roles within Star Trek. The first one that I distinctly remember was in the pilot of Deep Space Nine, where you played the first Vulcan captain, and you were the Cisco actually was your first officer, Benjamin Cisco, on that ship at Wolf 359. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and some of the other Star Trek roles that you ended up ultimately playing, of course, in addition to Martok? Yeah, I did, you know, uh, Armada, Star Trek Armada, Star Trek Online, yeah. uh, Star Trek House Divided, game after game after game of the Star Trek Enterprise. And um, it was Voyager, and I played a Herojin. Oh, yeah. What was it like fighting Dwayne The Rock Johnson in that episode? Yeah, no, I didn't get to fight him. Oh. I oh. I was forced to struggle with uh, Seven of Nine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was brutal, brutal, but I lost. I, I let her win. One. Come on. <laughs> and it's because of Star Trek. It's because Gene Roddenberry, who, uh, until Lucille Ball of all people said, Let's green light this sucker, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really an amazing story. And that has come down, has dripped all the way down to me. G.G. <laughs> Herzler as General Marta. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Hello, truckies, and welcome back to A Captain's Log. I'm your host, Brian Kreutz, joined, as always, by our wonderful co-host, Lily Fox Lim. And we are interviewing the Honorable J.G. Hertzler on this episode. Yes, let's continue our discussion about all things Star Trek past, present, and of course future, as they all apply in those tents for J.G. Hertzler. That's right, he's been on so many series. Can you tell us one of your favorite Klingon phrases? Or maybe a song? I know one of my favorite songs is Koi Kalish Pook Lord. Like that? None that I'd like to share, <laughs> but um, uh, I would like to share the Klingon anthem with you. Uh, there are 37 verses, so I'll reduce it. I'll just sing the one. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it starts out with a, you know, a beat. Bom, bom, bom. Koi ke les puk lon, koi puk be puk. Yach ba mach ba jesu vi, se mak chu me uu. 
Machu Manang Machakjo Nabayan Bajak Voku Yak Baches Bez Esjo Kista Vapumadi Buparek Mashuptak Komamev Komasuptak Ma O And uh, yeah, that's the Klingon anthem. That's beautiful. Uh, Bob O'Reilly, Bob has never learned the words because <laughs> we were, let's see, we were sitting up where, where I learned that was for the CD-ROM that Jonathan Frakes, in fact, when I auditioned for Jonathan Frakes, the thing I was reading had a bunch of Klingon words in it. And I said, I don't, I don't, I don't have any idea how Klingon is uh, pronounced. This was in the very beginning. And so I said, what can I do? What can I do? I, I, uh, oh, I know. I'll speak in a foreign language. Uh, uh, I don't know a foreign language. <laughs> well, at that point, I said, I said, French, no. My mother was a French teacher. Um, and, uh, and I said, no, French sounds like French. That's much too flowery. For kind of, uh, but, well, how, how about German? No, oh, oh, I'll do Latin. Because I had memorized long ago in Latin. She was a French and Latin teacher. But I took Latin for years. I didn't take anything good. That's why I can't remember college. I didn't take any courses of worth. What I took Latin. Um, anyway, little did I know Latin would get me into Star Trek. Well, I said no, Worf. This is this is not right, Worf. Cause great tundum, ebute de Catalina, patientia nostra, cram what freedom no se ludet, imovero in sonatos high tech intelligent. You know, so I did that. So. Uh, Jonathan said, <laughs> he was totally laughing, and he said, uh, you know, I've never had anybody audition with Latin before <laughs> for anything. Uh, and then he said, I love Latin. Uh, there, the, There's nothing written now for you in this show, but I'm going to ask the writers to write you in. <laughs> Kids ask me sometimes, how, how, what do I, how do I, how did you get into Star Trek? How do you, how do I get into uh, Star Trek. How do I get, learn Latin? <laughs> <laughs> you went over Jonathan Frakes' heart in that audition for sure. That's awesome. That is I hilarious. Did. I did, and we have been friends ever since. I never worked with him except for that. Now, JG, one of my favorite stories you were talking to me about was your friendship with Star Trek producer writer Ira Stephen Bear. Now, please share your story about how Ira told you Martok would be brought back in Deep Space Nine and he can have his damaged eye back after losing it in a fight with a Jim at R. But you felt Martok should remain eyeless. Can you tell us about that? Ira said, uh, you know, we can, get your, we, can, we can get your eye back when they decided to bring me back and they decided to bring Martok back because uh, Ira said, we realized, oh, uh, Worf can have a friend. Um, because Galron wasn't really Worf's friend, um, and the Dura sisters were questionable. <laughs> um, so, and Worf had nobody to commiserate about the old days with, uh, or his culture. So uh, they brought they brought Martok back, sort of, I think, as a little bit of a sounding board. Once you get your foot in the door, I just sort of force that door open a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And eventually, uh, Iris said, you know, we can get your eye back by giving you an artificial eye. You won't have to walk around with it. I said, oh, please, Ira, no, do not fix my eye. Um, first of all, Klingons would never get a artific an artificial eye. Uh, you know, and secondly, one of the great attractions of Klingons is they look like a cross between kiss and a pirate and uh and i said just let me have that sliced up miserably with the eye and um and he said okay you know it's cheaper for he said we don't have to make an artificial eye contact it, it, they wanted to put it on my right eye but i said no don't they literally had to tape my eyelid closed on the makeup, the make makeup took about four hours every time. Oh, wow. They had to wow. tape the eyelid closed and then put another piece of glue, another patch of latex over my eye, another, a scar latex. Uh, all the scarring had to go on top of that. So it took a long time to lay the pieces. And Michael Westmore and the whole Westmore family are the genius makeup artists of Hollywood 
since 1920 or before. I mean, they made Klingons look so real that people, I think, even myself, you see it, oh yeah, that's a Klingon, of course, as if they really exist. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing forced you to suspend your disbelief. So I was, I was very lucky because Michael Westmore did my makeup for the first few days uh, that I was on it. And then it moved on to Dave Kwashnick, who, uh, another dear friend who's gone. His name was Q for Kwashnick. Everybody knew him as Q. And uh, oddly enough, a makeup man or woman and the actor they're making up have a bond eventually, especially over five, six years, mm -hmm. that is very, very strong. And uh, so I miss, I miss Dave uh, quite a bit. A captain's log returns in a moment. JG, what's it like to be a part of a brand like Star Trek that not only has millions of fans around the world, but many of those fans can even speak some Klingon constructed language. These fans are scattered among three generations now. Can you share that with us, uh, some of the experiences and what you think it's like? As with life itself, one never knows what it's like doing what you do because you have no perspective on doing something else sometimes, you know? So it is, you have to, I have to pinch myself. We appeared as our mothers in a bar in England, in London. Paige's bar uh, was a big Star Trek hangout and they did a little bit and they, we, we introduced ourselves because they were not unable to get Galron and Martok themselves, the actors, uh, because they had work. So they were able to contract uh, our mothers. So we showed up as our mothers uh, at Paige's bar. Uh, you know, the, we, we've had more fun than is legal. And um, it's been an incredible experience. Now, switching gears a little bit, your father, who served our great country as a career Air Force, uh, passed away from a rare disease called scleroderma, and ever since then you've been involved in fighting it. Uh, can you tell us about the disease and your activism around it? There are two, he had two diseases, one, and they usually almost always go together, and they attack women more than men, I didn't know. Mm. Um, Renault's phenomenon, and, and I was able to add some of this to the character that I played, uh, Martok, when he was telling Worf the story of why Martok refused to um, forgive Kor, mm -hmm. who wanted an honorable death upon uh, through my ship, I asked the writer, who is brilliant, uh, Ron Moore, I said, can I add a line uh, to this speech to bring it all around to the... Because my father died before... All he said to me about when I first talked about being an actor, he said, well, you know, John, uh, there's a lot of kooks in that business. <laughs> <laughs> he passed away before I really did anything in Hollywood. My father had higher hopes for me. In that speech I had, he wanted his son to become an officer. To Worf, explaining why I would not forgive Kor. The last line, I wanted it to be, why do I refuse core this one request because he is the man who prevented my father from realizing the only wish he ever had for his son getting into officers candidate school in the klingon world core stopped it wouldn't let me there and that's where the speech ended and then i said could i add the fact that nevertheless i am the General, Supreme Commander of the Ninth Fleet. Unfortunately, my father did not live to see this day. That almost makes me cry now. But it, it was, I, and, and Ron, Ron recognized, Ron Moore recognized the power of it. And he said, absolutely, John, go ahead, add that. And on start on DS9, I don't know about the other shows, but there was not much hijinks. There were, there was little bit, very, a very limited amount of you really couldn't change a word, change a line without getting approved from the producer writers. So it was a huge gift from Ron Moore to me and to Martok uh, to be able to say that. Wow, JG, and it came full circle with the original Klingon core. 
writer Ronald D. Moore letting you add that to the script about your father. That's that's truly a touching story. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's exactly what it was. That's and, you know, John, and I had the greatest respect for John Colicos. JG, it was such an honor to have you here on a captain's log with Lily and I. Live long and don't hire Bob O'Reilly. <laughs> Manifested yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy.